verses 34 through 40, and uh, just want to give you a little preview. I'm reading from the New International Version because there's a little bit of emphasis that Alex uh, will explain as he, as he preaches um, that's given in the NIV as, a, as opposed to the uh, uh, other translations. So Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Let's pray together. Father, again, we thank you for your word. We, uh, we put our minds and our hearts and our ears in a posture now to receive from you, to welcome the truth of your word in our lives. Your word, which is truth, Lord Jesus, the words that you spoke we ask now for Alex that you would grant him the anointing of your Holy Spirit, that he would speak the words that we need to hear, and that we would welcome them, and that we would live them out by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, as, as has been mentioned earlier, give us today a day of great faith, where we ourselves can be stretched in our hearts and our minds to trust you even more and to live in the freedom that Christ has granted to us. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Alex, would you come and share with us, please? Thank you, Tim. Morning. Morning. Hope you're doing well. Good morning to those of you who are tuning on, tuning in on Facebook. This is the first time I've done this, so it's a little—I mean, not speaking in front of church, but doing it live over a <laughs> streaming thing. But um, a new world. So it's great to be here with you today. And uh, Catherine would love to have been here. She will come, Lord willing, next week with me. She just finished up a three-day conference, pretty intensive virtual conference. She was supposed to be out in Colorado, but a conference, that's sort of the last step of uh, confirming people who are going through the application process with the NAVs to go overseas. So uh, she was the director of that conference, so I had a lot of responsibility this time. It's pretty wiped out, so she's at home resting. Um, You know, I take it as a big, to, to come up here and to give the message, I take it as a very big responsibility. Um, I don't take it lightly. And this week, I've prayed about what to share. I've worked on what to share. Um, and I believe that God's in it. But uh, I appreciate praying for me already, but I really need to go before God. So, please join me. Lord, thank you again for this day that we are able to be here. And I pray for everyone here and others listening that you would speak to us. I want to give to you what I prepared. You really know my heart behind it. Um, and I'm trusting that they are your words that they 
or what you want me to say today. But I also pray, knowing that your Holy Spirit works in each of us, that people hear what they need to hear. I think that's the powerful thing, one of the powerful things of your word, is that one sentence can speak to so many of us in so many ways, and it's because of your Spirit. Thank you that we are not left in front of a text like any other, but that you are speaking to us. We pray that you would do that today. Please lead me, Lord. And in your son Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, for myself, just to let you know, um, my mind is like a bag of cats. Uh, so you know what all that means. I have to really keep a firm grip on it or they're going to get out and go all over the place. So I write out my sermons. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to go all sorts of tangents. Well, preachers have different styles. We were at a um, uh, church for several years where uh, the pastor always started out giving a story. I think that was great. Sort of did a good job of getting people engaged, woken up. I don't really know what my style is, but um, I'm typically my, my style, was, I think, is just to jump right in. So hopefully you're awake. If you're at home watching on the couch, maybe sort of sit up a little straighter. I don't know. <laughs> uh, enjoy your cup of coffee, which I was hoping for today, but I guess because of the whole COVID thing, I was waiting for the coffee bar, and it just wasn't there. <laughs> so, um, well, the past... Uh, the passage that uh, Pastor Jim just read is about relationships. Our relationship with God and our relationship with others. This is how Jesus summarized the law that was given to the Israelites in the Old Testament. So we see in this, when he summarizes it, that there's a vertical element and a horizontal element. That vertical element which came first, our relationship with God determines the type of horizontal relationships that we have. Today I want to speak mostly on this second kind of relationship, our relationship with others, because I think, I believe that those relationships, these relationships that we have with each other and with others outside the church are a powerful force in our lives and a powerful force in the lives of others. And because of this, I think it's good for us to periodically examine the relationships, how we're relating to others. But before I jump into that, let me briefly, since those relationships do come from our relationship with God, let me jump into that. So if we look at the Ten Commandments, the first four, if you look at them, they deal with us and God. Don't have any other gods before me, don't make any idols, keep the Sabbath, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Okay. Then you look at the next six, and they all have to do with how we interact with each other. Don't steal, don't lie, don't envy, don't commit adultery. So, as we look at this, we realize that it really makes sense that Jesus summarized it like this. Love God, love your neighbor. It's interesting, I heard a quote this past week, sort of a joke. Why does the Bible sometimes say, love your neighbor, and sometimes it says, love your enemy? Well, sometimes it's because they're the same person. <laughs> but that's not what I'm getting to here. So when one of the Pharisees asked Jesus in Matthew 22, what is the great command or the greatest command, depending on your virgin? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So the first thing we have is to love God. What does that mean? What does it mean to love God? Well, that's a whole series of sermons right there. Actually, it's a whole lifetime of learning how to do that. But let me just throw out there that I think it means that we have God in our mind as the focus of our lives. That we want to live our lives to honor Him that we understand that he loves us and that we love him because of that. Because he loves us, we love him. And then we're able to love others. 
That's the key element behind our relationships with other people. By understanding that we live in a relationship with God and that we respond to His love, the goal of our lives is to live a life that is pleasing God, that honors Him, that, a life that He wants us to live. And as we do that, we have a fulfilling life. A life that has purpose. If you look at, you see this connection when Jesus talks in John 15, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. The fruit in our lives comes out of our relationship with God. And I think a large part of this fruit is our relationships. So I believe that when we interact with each other, we need to understand that the key component there is what is our relationship with God. That affects, that brings focus to our relationship with others. Now, jumping into our relationships with others, we can look at it in one sense of there are two different kinds, two different groups of people. It's one way to look at it that we relate with. Non-Christians and Christians. Dawson Trotman, the founder of The Navigators, had this illustration that uh, sort of helps me and helps a lot of people understand this dynamic. Any of you heard of the will? If you've any, ever done any Navigator material, that's a classic tool or a diagram, image. Well, the will that Dawson drew out, the outer hub was the obedient Christian, the Christian living in response to God. The inner hub was Christ the center. And then that will had four spokes, two vertical spokes, two horizontal spokes. The two vertical spokes referred to how we related to God. And there's a lot of ways that we relate to God, but the two ones that are most common and that are key, I think, or through the word and through prayer. And then the two horizontal spokes were witnessing or evangelism and fellowship or community. Those are things that we need to think about. Now, there's a lot of different ways. Well, there's a reason that we have this orientation. For instance, I'm here this morning and I'm speaking to you as believers. I'm using a particular vocabulary and probably using words that a non-Christian wouldn't understand. But beyond, by the way, I'm a linguist, so I really like considering those kind of things. But beyond that, we all have as the focus of our lives Jesus. And that means that we share a ton of things that we don't share with non-Christians. So there is a difference in the relationships that we have. So how are we called to relate to non-Christians? Biblically, what does it say? You know, there are different verses that we can look at, but what I want to focus on, just for a few minutes, is how did Jesus relate to non-Christians? The reason I like doing that is because if you look at the epistles, the epistles were written by different authors to communities of believers. So it's teaching to Christians. It's talking inside the church. But when you look at Jesus, you see, okay, how did he really interact with non-Christians? If you look at how he interacted with the Samaritan woman at the well, how he interacted with the rich young ruler, with Nicodemus, who became a follower of Jesus, but the first time he came, he came at night. Remember the Sanhedrin? Sanhedrin is probably scared of anybody seeing that he was interacting with Jesus. If you look at him with Zacchaeus, with Matthew, the tax collector who later became one of his disciples, what do you see? You see him entering into relationships, sharing his life with them, never backing away from the truth, sharing that as well, but going into their homes, eating, spending time with them, not being afraid of being seen with them. I think that sharing the gospel with someone, telling someone the gospel is fundamental. But I also think that our lives lived out before others is also fundamental. Us relating to them. This is what we experienced in Argentina. In a context where almost everyone had heard the name of Jesus, we came across hardly anyone outside of the church that we went to 
We almost never came across someone who knew personally or related to a follower of Jesus. And the people who came to know Christ in our ministry, typically, I think almost all of them, came to know Jesus after spending time with us. That's not because we were better, but they saw a correlation between words and our actions in our lives. So with non-Christians, we have a purpose. We have the opportunity to tell them about Christ and also live it out before them. Our goal, our hope, our prayer in those relationships is that they come to know Jesus. Now, if we look at our relationship with, non, with believers, we have a lot of verses that speak very specifically to this. And like I said, the epistles, teaching the Christians, and if you, take, if you take out the verses that are dealing with how we relate to each other, you're going to be taking out a large portion of these epistles. They speak a lot to this. Let me read you. Well, first of all, you know, one thing, if you like doing Bible study, which I encourage you to do, um, a great study is to look at the term, look up the term one another in the New Testament. And uh, you'll see some amazing things. You'll see a lot of things. Let me read you a couple of verses. John 13, 35. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Rejoice from Romans 12 doesn't really have one another, but I'm going to share it anyway. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. John 14, 13, let's not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide not to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of another. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace. Galatians 5, 13, through love serve one another. Let me share a couple of negative ones. Galatians 5, 14 through 15. The whole law was summed up in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, you'll be consumed by one another. Galatians 5, 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Guys, these are strong words, strong commands. And when I look at those, the fact is they act, Scripture acts as a mirror for me and, and I see that I fail often. When we live in community as God has called us to, we have an amazing potential to be light to the world. And I don't know if any of you have ever done the Myers-Briggs personality test. Any of you heard of it? Okay, it seems like a lot of nods here. Well, I'm an INFP. I-N-F-P. Everybody's already thinking, okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> okay. What that means is I'm an idealist. That's what that personality type is classified as. And the fact is, I am an idealist. I have visions or images of how things should be. How our community of believers should be. And by the way, you're going to hear me today using the word, the phrase, community of believers instead of the word church. That's because I'm talking about relationships. So that's, I've chosen that term specifically as I talk today. But I have this vision of what our community of believers should be. I turned 50 in December, getting up there in age. Um, and, but as I've gone from my youthful idealism and just lived life, I have, well, what do you think? I have seen that that ideal, the reality, it seems like reality comes crashing in, and I don't quite see that ideal, that vision. For brief moments, I do, and it's exciting, and then, like I said, reality seems to break in. And I'm not saying this to throw the blame at anyone else. I'm part of the problem. Now, what's my response to that? In spite of those failures, in spite of my failures, I'm also realizing that I need to go back and continue to pursue it, not give up. Sometimes it's hard to speak, to give a vision like this in church. 
because it raises everyone's hope. This is what it's going to be like. And then we fail miserably. And people get hurt. People become jaded. Some people leave church. But I don't think that we leave it to the side. I think we need to go for it. So what does it mean to live in community with believers? Well, let's go back to the basic. Love one another. Now, I know, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but as probably most of you know, uh, there are a lot of different words in Greek, philia, agape, eros, and others, that we use the word love for. Love in English has a very cement, wide semantic field of meaning. Um, if I say, Alfie, I love you, which is true, then I look at Catherine and say, I love you, I'm not saying the same thing. I am saying the same thing, but I'm not saying the same thing. You know what I mean? I'm saying the same words, but I'm meaning something different. She'll explain it next week. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's jump into it a little bit. First of all, I don't think that love is an emotion, and that seems to be what a lot of people think these days. If it was an emotion, I don't think there'd be a command to do it. Um, that's just how I see it. Because I can command you, you know, I can sing you the song by Bobby McFerrin. Don't worry, be happy. Okay, let's switch the switch. I'm happy. No, you just can't change your, you can't command someone. Well, you can command them, but they're not going to be able to do it just to change an emotion. Now, I can take steps. I can think about great memories. I can uh, think about the blessings, the tremendous number of blessings I have in my life. And that'll affect the emotion. But I can't just say, okay, I'm going to be happy. So I don't think that love is just an emotion. But I think this is sort of this idea of being happy involves taking, if I want to, I need to take some steps, some actions. I think that's what part of love is. It is taking loving action toward others. And I think uh, Pastor Jim was talking about um, forgiveness recently. Uh, forgiveness is a tough thing for me. It's tough for me because of the emotions that are involved. Forgiveness isn't an emotion. Forgiveness means acting in forgiveness to others, I think. And we hope that the emotions, that the emotions accompany it with time. But if someone hurts me, but I forgive them, believe it or not, that happened. Um, the hurting part. The forgiveness, I think, also. Um, I have to still deal with emotions for a while. But I act in that commitment of forgiveness to someone. So I think that love means us acting in love for each other. I think it also means that we set our minds on things that we look at how we think about others. It involves examining our hearts. We're interacting here with other people who have the same desire in their lives to live to honor Jesus. People who love Jesus, who want to know God, who are committed to his word. Loving others in our community of believers means encouraging them in that. Acting in that way. Meeting each other's needs. Supporting each other. Now Galatians 6.10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. As you can see, this is more of an action command than or understandably actionable command than love each other. But what does it mean to do good to each other? Well, thinking about loving each other, the word in doing good to each other, the word that comes to mind for me is caring. And related to caring are two prepositions that help me understand this. For and about. Now, in Spanish, that would end up being two different verbs. To care for someone is cuidar. 
to do things. To care for someone means I see their needs. And when we look at the first century church, which is a great vision for us, when we look at the first century church, we see that they had a ton of physical needs. That they brought their resources together and cared for each other. Thinking about that, how can you help other people in your community, in the community of believers, in the community around you, with their needs? What are you good at? Are you good at something? Sure, you're good at something. How can you use that to help others? Maybe it's helping them repair something at their home. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, giving financial advice. Maybe it's uh, if, someone, <clears throat> if someone's sick, fixing meals for them. Especially now with this whole COVID thing, I think there's a lot more ways that we can serve each other. I think there are a lot more needs. Older folks who maybe can't get out in public to do the shopping they need. That's caring for someone. Caring about someone, in a sense, means taking my eyes off myself and putting my eyes on them. In Spanish, to care about someone, we would use the word importar. doesn't mean to import, but it's more connected to important. It's important to me. Caring about someone means that they're important to you. Do we know how each other's doing? Once more, really in the midst of all this stress that we're living through, do you know how other people are doing? How this is affecting their lives? How are the kids doing? What are their, how are they struggling? Now guys, I want to just make a little side note here. When you start knowing what's going on with people, we see it as there's a problem. Now guys, what do we do with the problem? We solve it. We solve it. We fix it. Or try to. Sometimes we just make it worse. Um, but a lot of the time, what people need, more than a solution, is just someone to share the burden with them. Just to talk to somebody about it. I have a wife and two daughters. And I have learned, am learning, that a lot of people are chuckling. Um, I am learning that I don't need to fix all their problems. And I can't fix it. It's hard for me, but what I need to do sometimes is just to listen. That doesn't, that doesn't seem very productive to me. But I mean, I'm not giving advice or anything like just listening. But that's really helpful for them. By the way, if you ever see videos on YouTube, look for, if you're married, look for the video, it's not about the nail. It's fabulous. Uh, you'll probably see it two different ways. <laughs> but it is, it's great. Just a little side note there. It's not about the nail. Um, so as a community of believers, we need, to be, we need to be committed to loving each other, to care for each other, to care about each other. You know what? When we do this, our community shines. That's why Jesus said people would know that they were his disciples if they loved one another. This is a powerful thing. It's evident to the world. Now, the situation we find ourselves in has put a lot of stress on our communities. COVID, the racial injustice issues that have come up, and with that demonstrations and at times uh, looting and rioting, the political context that we're living in, having to wear these masks all the time. By the way, I like wearing the mask. It covers up my gray hair. <laughs> so when I go to a great, this is, I'm being truthful here. I go to a grocery store with a mask on. Sorry, that's changing the sound. I go into a uh, store, grocery store with a mask on, and I'm waiting in line, and you know what I hear? Step on up here, young man. Oh, I like that. <laughs> now, 
Catherine has gray hair uh, on top. And, uh, and so when she wears a mask, it sort of highlights that. You know the question that she's got? Do you qualify for the discount? <laughs> she had a good humor about it. She, she laughed. What discount? You know, the senior discount. No! But anyway. So, but we have um, a lot of things in our current situation that are putting stress on our communities and, and on our relationships. So looking at that, I want to draw our attention to three things that I see as putting stress that are affecting our relationships with others outside the body, but also among our relationships. The first thing is too much information. We're living in a period of time where we're saturated with information. When I was growing up, you wanted to get the news, you had to be at home at 6 o'clock. You got 30 minutes of local news and then 30 minutes of, of uh, national and world news. And we had three options. You know, you only had three channels. If you really felt like it, staying up late, 11 o'clock, you could hear the local news again. But now we've got a seen theme, an endless number of channels. Many channels that give us news 24 7. We've got streaming services, we can see movies, shows anytime we want to. Uh, not only that, now we have the internet. You can read anything you want to, see anything you want to at any time. What's even more, you've got a cell phone, so you can carry it with you anywhere you go. There are no boundaries on the amount of information that we can be getting. The only boundaries that are there are the ones that we put. I think without these limits, we live distracted lives, and our relationships fall to the side. I think that our technological age, that in it, one of the greatest challenges is not necessarily the wrong things, but too many things. Too many things that distract us. What's important? Maybe we need to turn off the TV. Maybe we need to turn off our computers. Maybe we need to turn off our phones. Or not pay attention to all the apps on it and actually use it to call each other. I believe that we've gone through a fundamental change in our communities. And I'm not anti-technology. Guys, don't, don't take that. Don't take that away from here. I'm just saying we've got all this going on, and it's, I'm distracted by it. Then I get to the end of the day, and I realize I really haven't interacted with anyone in a deep way. The problem for many of us is that we've gotten into habits. You may have gotten in habits of watching hours and hours of TV, whether it's news or movies or whatnot, or being online a lot. It's hard to change those habits. But think about them. Maybe you need to. I don't know. Now, the next thing all right. Up till now, I think everybody's with me. I don't think I said anything controversial. Okay, here I'm going to start stepping into some, wading into some deeper water. I listened a little bit to how uh, from last week's message, how Pastor Jim introduced us, and he said I was going to give you a view from 30,000 feet. Well, I'm going to drop it down to about 2,000. I think we're, one of the things that's affecting our community is that we're getting our priorities messed up. Although this is related to the first thing, I'm specifically talking about the political context that we find ourselves in. Now guys, I want to tell you this. I'm struggling with this myself. I'm struggling with my relationships with others. This right here is me sharing what I'm going through and what I think I'm learning. We live in a very, an extremely polarized political context right now. I don't know enough about history. I, I, I guess politics have always been polarized. But right now, that polarization is so full of emotion. 
that it's hard to have a conversation with someone who sees things differently than me, politically. I want to ask you a question. This is a diagnostic tool. Okay? I want you to think about four groups of people. You can keep this straight. All right, I'm going to actually mention candidates' names here, okay? So brace yourself. Um, four groups of people. Those who support Trump and are Christians. Those who support Trump and are not Christians. Those who support Biden and are Christians. And those who support Biden and are not Christians. Got it? Those four groups? You already start feeling uneasy? Oh, he's going there. Oh. You might already be thinking, well, there can't be anybody in that group. <laughs> I think this speaks strongly to what's going on right now and how it's affecting us. Now, I know, these, I know issues are important. Politics are important. They are. There are biblical values that are at play in our laws and in the character of our leaders. I'm not saying this is not important. But go back to those four groups. Okay, you got them clear in your head? Think about to yourself. Don't, don't say it out loud, please. Which group are you in? Got it in your head? Which one of those four groups are you in? Next question. Now, the other three groups, which one will you, would you relate to best? Does that make sense, my question? Now, of the other three groups, the three groups that you're not in, who would you relate to best out of those other three groups? Did you answer it to yourself? Now, recently I asked a friend, a friend who I respect very much, the same question. And he responded, I'm in the group that supports candidate A as a Christian. And when I asked him, what group would you connect with next? He said, the group that supports candidate A and non-Christian. I was almost shocked. He related or saw himself connect better with someone who, who supported the same political candidate that he did rather than someone who worshipped Jesus. I didn't know what to do with that. I said, really? But that, I think that speaks to what's going on. If you go online, you'll find articles written by Christians who say, how can you be a Christian and support this candidate? Then you'll go and find other articles by other Christians saying, if you're a Christian, how can you support this candidate? What I want to say here is that we need to remember that Jesus comes first. Of course, my relationship with Jesus will inform the choices I make, who I vote for, and the issues. But relationally, at the end of the day, I'm going to focus on what God calls me to. And remember that he's placed me in relationships with people so that I can honor him. Are my political views placing stumbling blocks to how I relate to others? Or how I present others, jump into them? Am I able still to point someone to Jesus even if they support someone else? Or am I more interested in pointing them to my candidate? I'm learning that I need to keep my eyes firmly set on Jesus. In the past two weeks, we've had two different, or the past month, we've had two different families, two different couples come and, uh, over to our house and hang out with us on the carport, of course. Um, one of those couples firmly supports one of the candidates. And the other couple firmly supports the other. They're both Christians. And I don't have the same political, I can of course have the same political views as both of them. 
But we had deep fellowship with each other. It was amazing. Maybe this whole thing's not a big deal to you. But maybe it is. Maybe you're as calm as, calm as a cucumber when you start talking politics to someone. But if not, I want to encourage you to examine your heart. Are you able to relate to others? Are you able to be light? The non-Christian's light? Who's supporting another candidate? Are you able to encourage and exhort a brother or sister if they don't have a, if they have a different political perspective than you do? Are you able not to get hung up on the words they're saying about politics and hear the words where they're sharing about what's going on in their lives? For some of us, this is extremely hard. Fact is, I don't have as strong of political views as a lot of my friends, and it's still hard for me. So if you do have strong views, I'm sure it's hard for you. It's not easy. Now the third thing that I believe in that's affecting our Christian community is somewhat a combination of the first two. It's the all this information, the polarization. And this the thing that's really affecting us is I think, is that this context, which I've already alluded to, is really charged emotionally. There are a lot of emotions at play here. And there's one emotion that just seems to be predominant to me. And it's not happiness. It's not joy. It's anger. It seems that any news story I hear it is oriented to one side or the other. But underneath both sides is just anger. And at times it seems like even hatred. What I think, one of the things that's easy for us to do is that we get caught up on the issues, which is fine, but that we ignore the heart that is going on behind it. We end up talking to each other, sharing a different, going back and forth about our opinions on politics, which is great. But we don't even realize that what we're doing is yelling at each other. Maybe not audibly, but inside. Because it has so much anger. We fall into this. Or a lot of us do. I look at how people talk in the world about this, and I do not see peace, love, joy, kindness. And the fact is, when I watch Christians talk about politics, I don't see it in them either. Often, not everyone. You understand what I'm saying? Have we decided to put the fruit of the Spirit on hold for two months? I believe that we need to understand how media is affecting our minds. Not only our minds, but also our emotions. I'm not anti-media. I'm not saying stop watching news or anything like that. What I am saying is that we need to be aware that it's sudden, subtly, subtly affecting our attitudes and our hearts. We need to be aware of that. It's like me saying that I can watch sexually explicit material and not be affected by it. That's crazy. It's going to affect how I see Catherine, how I see other women. It's going to affect my relationship. The news itself is not wrong, but the climate in which we find ourselves, in my opinion, is one of extreme anger. And it's seeping into us. Or it has the potential to seep into us. Anger is one of the major destroyers of relationships. Anger can destroy our community of believers. We need to be careful. How do you respond when someone disagrees with you? Does your heart start beating faster? Does your voice start to rise? By the way, this goes a lot further than just someone with a different political issue. This is, how do you respond to people anytime they disagree with you? How do you respond to your spouse when they think your child's behavior should be dealt differently 
dealt with differently than you. You know, in our team, we like using a lot of hand signals to, like, I'm, what, I'm watching you. You know, for anger, they go, you know, sort of emulating the, you know, your vein right here just popping. <laughs> How do you respond to a coworker who disagrees with you or treats you disrespectfully? How do you feel about the person that when you hit a yellow light and you decide to stop, honks the horn from behind you? Okay, that's a tough one for me, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anger, anger affects our relationships. Well, for some of you, the topic of politics, with this topic of politics, you may, I don't know, I don't, I don't know what this holds for you. But you may find that it just always brings up a lot of anger for you. If that's the case, then maybe you just need to decide, nope, I'm not talking about it. That's okay. Some people can have a beer or a glass of wine. Some people can't. It's not a weakness to recognize that you have areas that you need to be careful with. Well, let me be clear about something. I'm not advocating that we don't talk about politics. I'm not saying that at all. We are blessed to live in a country where we get to vote. We get to play a role in who our leaders are. That's a huge thing, guys. And it's completely fine to talk with other people. We affect, the fact is we do affect other people's votes. And if you feel strongly about it, talk to someone. Explain your reasoning. Help them to think about it. Help me to think about it differently. So speak in love. Be gentle and remember that before the fact that you're a Republican or a Democrat, you're a follower of Jesus. And that's where our ultimate loyalty lies. Brothers and sisters, we are called to live for Jesus. We are called to be a sacrificial community of believers where we serve and love each other. We are called to be light in the world. Let's do it. Now I've covered a lot of topics today. But let me summarize a few points which I believe are key. Our relationship with Jesus orients our relationships with other people. We are called to love others. Our attitudes and our hearts affect how we relate to others. And thinking about that, let me leave you a few questions. What is your focus? How can you love others? What steps can you take? How can you express that love to others? How can you pursue deeper fellowship with other believers? It's not easy right now, especially. It's great to be able to see you guys get together. It's great. And the last question is, what attitudes in my heart block me from having this fellowship, this deeper fellowship with others? Like I said earlier, these questions, these thoughts come from my own journey in dealing with this. It's not easy for me. I want to live for Jesus in the middle of the challenges that we're facing. And I want to encourage you to do the same. Thanks. If you want to talk about it or have questions or disagreements, whatever, you're welcome to talk to me afterwards. I don't mind. I'm around here. Okay. Thank you. Can I pray real quick? Lord, um, once more, just going back to my prayer at the beginning and prayer now, is that you would speak to us. We do want to be light. We want to love you. We want to have deep community with each other. And each of us have our own things that are challenges for us that keep us from doing that well. 
Help us to see those things. Help me to see those things in my life. Help me to respond in love when people may attack me. Help us all to do that. Help us to look at Jesus and see how he lived. He was definitely attacked. Help us to stay focused on what is holy, what is right, and good. Thank you, Father. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. with these words as a benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, 
working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's go and be the church in Christ's power. Amen. Amen. Why should I gain?